you know, as we started to say earlier, I think Bob mentioned, Memorial Day actually started sometime around 20 years before my own grandparents were born. Hard to believe. But back in May 30th, 1868, General John Logan proclaimed it as Decoration Day. And yes, it was a day of remembrance for those who have died in the service of the United States. It was a date chosen, again, because it was, it was not the anniversary of any particular battle. So they thought maybe that would be a good day to, uh, to not get confused with anything. Um, on the first Decoration Day, General James Garfield made a speech at Arlington National Cemetery, and 5,000 participants decorated the graves of the 20,000 Union and Confederate soldiers that were buried there. Arlington National Cemetery now has the remains of over 400,000 soldiers. Sometime prior to World War I, actually in 1915, I believe, a woman named Moena Michael inspired a poem. Inspired by the poem called In Flanders Fields, she wrote a short poem inspiring her to wear the now popular red poppy flower. During Memorial Day, I have mine here, and I'm sure everybody has a woman. The poem is four short lines, and it reads, We cherish, too, the poppy red, that grows on fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies. Three years ago, I started down a path to help us all honor our World War II veterans. It was a door I knew that needed to be opened where we could all learn in great detail the sacrifices our veterans have truly made. I'm here to tell you there were no survivors. Oh sure, many soldiers lived through the war. They lived through it, but not unscathed. It has certainly changed them forever in ways only they know. Battle scars, details of destruction, death, broken families, and the worst treatment our, our fellow man has ever seen in, in humanly possible. They've seen it all. In the name of freedom and safety, they chose to fight literally for our freedom. Men that willingly chose to fight for their mothers, little brothers, sisters, and neighbors. Then they learned to fight for their fellow soldiers. No longer was their goal just our freedom, but to the flag. It was to live through today and keep their fellow soldiers alive through another day. No need to worry about tomorrow yet. It wasn't here. And for many, there would be no tomorrow. As hard as they fought and as bad as they wanted to come home, many would have been left behind. Their fellow soldiers that would come home still had a job to do, to remember them when they were killed, to bring back their personal belongings from their lockers, how horrific that must have been for them, for their families to mourn over, to hold on to them a bit longer, keepsakes for their families and to honor them forever. Then when the smoke and dust finally settled, the greatest generation returned home without any fanfare. They married, found jobs, and raised families. And once again, protecting us from what they had recently witnessed by keeping these stories to themselves. Just amazing. The research I've chronicled has stories of our fathers, for some of you, your grandfathers. Or possibly it's just a nice old man who lives next door with the American flag waving from his front porch. These stories are the ones they should have told us. They could have told us, but chose not to. It didn't even matter if we asked. We wanted to close that door and keep the boogeyman away from us, hoping to forget the nightmares they witnessed as young men. I can now say that didn't work either. I was recently, recently informed that one of the World War II veterans I interviewed had been diagnosed with PTSD at the age of 91. After more than 70 years of carrying the pain and burden he had witnessed, that's over 25,550 nights of dreams, of possible recollections of days he was trying to forget. You see, every year, as Memorial Day adds more veterans to its exclusive list, it's one less veteran we should have honored while they were alive. Like many of you, my dad has come and gone too, taking with him his own veteran stories from World War II. And maybe we should have pushed him for those stories, but it probably wouldn't have changed his mind. He closed that door pretty tight. Although I've been told that in the old days, the veterans would gather at the local VFWs to share their stories and to drink to their lost friends. But I think it's equally important we honor them today 
as well as their gravestones and stories in the future. These soldiers were not born to be soldiers. They were born like us, into parents that only wanted more for their children than they had. But I may not be telling you anything you haven't heard, but they have told me plenty I have never heard. I'd like to share with you some of the few short quotes from my interviews. I'll start with a Lunenburg resident and World War II veteran, Charlie Sanderson, who's sitting right here in the front. Thank you, Charlie. One day he said to me, people don't know what it's like to be scared. When you can't see it, and you don't know where it's coming from, you get scared. Anyone who said they weren't scared is a damn liar. There's another resident who passed away this past December, Lunenburg resident, Joe Piminello. He said, uh, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. We were in formation. One plane was hit. The wing fell right off the plane. It was shot and folded right up. One of the guys was burned really badly and got thrown out of the ship. He was the only one. The B-24, you don't get out of it. That's the idea. If you're lucky, you make it. You had to be in a damn good position. You either had to get thrown out or something. You do carry the chutes. We'd see a few go down. The idea was to count them see who's gone and who isn't. I don't know how I made it back. So many didn't. Another one from Lemister resident and recipient of a Purple Heart and a Distinguished Service Cross, World War II soldier Santa de Sava. He explained to me while talking about his Distinguished Service Cross, we were pinned down and couldn't move. Something had to be done. They were in the woods and we were pinned down in a great vineyard. We couldn't go anywhere until we stopped that machine gun. I never expected to get anything for it. It ain't why I did it. You know, a war's a war. Then the following day, we were able to move forward. The machine guns were gone. Another story from a B-17 World War II lower ball turret gunner from Fitchburg. His name is Larry Radio. And one of the things he told me was, I remember sitting in my turret on one mission, just rotating the turret up and down, around, just searching in my own thoughts, alone. Just the drone of the engines and the slipstream whisking around the turret and the intercom quiet. And in my mind, I thought I could hear the angels singing. It was distant and like a church choir, eerie indeed, but sort of peaceful at the same time. The thought passed in my head, I wonder if this is going to be my day. It wasn't at all upsetting. That was Christmas Eve, 1944. And then another one. Fitchburg's World War II soldier from the Battle of the Bulge, George Pelletier, shared a letter to his wife with me, and in part, it said, <clears throat> excuse me, so the boys I came over with in my platoon aren't coming back, he went on to say. All through this, I've learned to realize a lot of things. I know what war is now. I've seen it. I've seen men die and maimed for life. I've seen homes destroyed, families all separated, poor, unfed little children. Now, when I get back home, I know it needs to be done, and no one is to cross me or any of these GIs who know all this. We owe a debt to our buddies, and we're going to see that what they wanted and dreamed about is accomplished. George is turning 92 years old in July. I was with him last week, and when I was there, he said, I didn't expect to live past 20. Amazing. Of the more than two dozen veterans I interviewed over a two-year period of time, 18 made it into my book. Of those, 15 have since passed away. We lose an average of one World War II veteran every three minutes. And we lose 22 veterans to suicide every day. Lost forever are their stories of courage, bravery, and love. When I was growing up, on Memorial Day, we would go to the cemetery, plant some fresh flowers, clean up the, clean up the graves, and say a few prayers, and go home and have a cookout. I'd say for the most part, it's now just a day off from work, and maybe a day at the beach, or just home relaxing. But during whatever you do today, at 3 p.m. local time, the National Moment of Remembrance, a resolution passed in December 2000, asks for all Americans to voluntarily and informally observe in their own way a moment of remembrance and respect, pausing from whatever they are doing for a moment of silence or listening to taps. Taps is always a tough one. From the voices of all the soldiers living, and those that have died, we need to honor them with their deeds and with their words. Thank you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you.